Okay, good morning. I'm going to talk about experimental oncolytic chemotherapy for individualized treatment of cancer patients incurable with routine approaches. Uh, so oncolytic uh, immunotherapy falls in the field of uh, cancer immunotherapy, and um, we currently have quite a lot of different products in that area. We have monoclonal antibodies, um, we, have, uh, we have cytokines, we have uh, oncolytic viruses, we have uh, adaptive cell therapies. Um, oncolytic viruses means a virus that has been modified in such a way that it doesn't uh, anymore replicate in normal cells but continues to replicate productively in tumor cells. And uh, it has very uh, unusual pharmacokinetics in the sense that there can be more, more drug in the patient after a few days than what you put in, because each uh, dying tumor cell can produce up to 100,000 uh, new virus particles. And um, often it's uh, applied locally, but nevertheless you get systemic effects. Um, there's two mechanisms which contribute uh, to that. One is that the, um, when the tumor cells burst, uh, the virus can end up in the systemic circulation and transduce metastases. Um, and also, the, uh, it turns out that the um, oncolytic cell death is quite an immunogenic phenomenon, uh, which can be seen also on systemic level. Um, in the US and EU, there's one oncolytic virus that has been approved, a uh, virus called Imilgic by a company called Amgen, that was studied in um, melanoma patients. Um, so all patients had, had metastatic melanoma, um, and the, uh, the main endpoint was durable response rate, so a response lasting at least six months, uh, which was positive, um, and also the more conventional overall response rate was um, better in the oncolytic virus treated uh, group. But as you can see from the, um, from the overall survival data, there were basically two types of patients. So these stage three patients, they had a locally advanced, locally progressing disease, while these stage four patients, they had a, a deep metastasis in the liver or lungs. So, so you can see that it was only these locally advanced patients, basically, which were receiving the overall survival benefit. <coughs> but an important phenomenon which applies to basically all tumor immunotherapies is that if the patients benefit, that benefit can last for a long time. Uh, so here's some follow-up data from the um, from the Amgen trial, showing that if you had a response, then that response can can then last for for years. And there are some some forms of of immunotherapy where the follow-up is uh, is is already more than ten years, and it turns out that if you get a complete response, you're you're quite likely actually to be alive uh, even after even after ten years. <coughs> The history of tumor immunotherapy is, is quite, uh, quite interesting. It starts about four and a half thousand um, years ago. Uh, it was um, written that uh, Imhotep, uh, an Egyptian um, doctor, was using a, a poultice, so you know, I guess some sort of dirty rag um, which was put on the tumor and then the tumor was, was cut um, and the, um, if an infection resulted which often happened, then often the um, tumor uh, went away, or at least got, got smaller. And then there's a, a famous case of St. Peregrine Laziosi, um, a priest who had a tumor in his leg, and um, supposedly um, Jesus stepped down from heaven and uh, touched the tumor, which, what, which got red and inflamed, and then the tumor, tumor went away. So in the, in the 1700s, they... Uh, um, oncology store, well, there wasn't really a field of oncology, but uh, people treating cancer, they tried to purposefully infect tumors. Um, uh, in, the, in the 1800s, uh, they started looking at different uh, specified pathogens uh, for their ability to er eradicate tumors. Um, Bill Coley was one of the, one of the uh, leaders uh, of this field in, in his time in the late 1800s. Um, you know, he, he would inject uh, patients with cancer, uh, first with uh, wild-type bacteria, so unmodified bacteria. Um, so this was based on, on, the, on, the, on, on the case reports that sometimes those tumors, tumors would go away. And then he tried to make it a bit more scientific uh, in the sense that he, you know, because often patients died because of adverse events, you know, these were uh, 
patients with often advanced cancer, so their immune system wasn't maybe um, doing so great. And if you infect that sort of a, a patient with a, a aggressive bacteria, sometimes the patient dies because of the of the bacterial infection. So he he tried to separate the uh, the component giving the efficacy uh, from the component giving the side effects by by growing the bacteria in the lab and then filtering the supernatants. And this resulted in a, a drug called cholestoxin, which was um, used to varying degrees for the next 50 or 60 years. But there was quite a lot of variation um, you know, with regard to efficacy. Uh, it was, um, the, the production was maybe not rigorously controlled, and it was also uh, of, of uh, key importance to, to dose the patient uh, uh, until the patient had a very high fever. And, uh, um, and and maybe not all doctors were using it as aggressively. Um, then, uh, after viruses were described as an entity uh, about 100 years ago, um, those um, were tried for for treatment of cancer, just you know contracting vir uh, viruses from uh, flu patients into cancer patients. Our own tool, the adenovirus, was described in the 50s. And that was almost immediately tried at the um, uh, National Institutes of, of Health. The, the first routine uh, immunotherapeutic um, was approved in 1977. Uh, this is still in use. It's, a, it's actually a tuberculosis vaccine, um, which is in, instilled locally in, uh, in the patients with bladder cancer. And it continues to be the most effective um, treatment of recurrent superficial bladder cancer. Then the first oncolytic virus was approved in China in 2005. The first cell therapy was approved in the US in 2010. Um, and, uh, uh, and the field uh, started changing rapidly after the approval of the first checkpoint inhibitors. Um, there's about six or seven now approved, and almost, almost every single tumor type is being uh, tested for, for treatment with this, um, this, these forms of, of immunotherapy. And uh, so, as you can see from the uh, font of the slide, I'm now going backwards uh, to 2007, uh, um, to, to our own situation. So uh, at the time, we had uh, constructed about 30 different uh, oncolytic adenomarses. We'd done a lot of uh, scientific work, published 100 papers. We had one patent application, but there was um, there was no possibility of acquiring um, academic funding for for a clinical trial with. Um, with a new drug, and we couldn't get any company interested in our in our patent. And so, at the same time, there was quite a lot of evidence already from patients that uh, adenomal gene therapy of cancer, including oncolytic uh, adenomyosis, can be can be quite effective. There were fifty uh, more than fifty thousand patients reported in the uh, in the literature, and there were um, you know, because there were a couple of newspaper articles and a few. TV programs, there were a lot of patients contacting us wanting to be treated. So we then have to decide if we want to keep on treating mice or if we would take the big step and start treating patients. Um, and I'll explain about that patient treatment program. So um, giving us faith at the time was the fact that the first uh, oncolytic uh, adenomars had also been, been approved for treatment of advanced um, head and neck uh, cancer. So, so what we came up with was the uh, what we call the Advanced Therapy Access Program. So this is based on an uh, EU directive um, which encourages um, uh, and sort of lay, lays down the rules and regulations for uh, patient by patient individualized treatment with uh, advanced therapies. So advanced therapies means gene therapy and, and cell therapies. So it's not a trial but an individualized uh, treatment program. So our, our, treat, uh, our thinking was that we could still learn from the treatments so that, uh, you know, because these are quite human specific agents, so it's, it's limited what you can learn in the lab. Um, so we thought that by treating these patients one by one, well, the patients would have a chance to, to benefit and maybe we would, already, uh, we would also learn, learn something from the treatments. <coughs> You're not supposed to see this slide in the background. This is um, just a list of the bullets that 
um, that I went through before starting the treatment program. So the idea was really to check everywhere uh, um, and to be um, to be sure that it was uh, okay and uh, allowed. <coughs> and the main uh, ethical principle uh, is written down in the World um, Medical Association uh, Article 32. Um, in fact, I think this number keeps on changing. It used to be 32, then it was 35, and now I think it's 37. Um, but the main message of that bullet is that, um, uh, that in, a, in the treatment of a patient where proven interventions do not exist or have been in, ineffective, the physician, after seeking expert advice with informed consent from the patient, uh, may use an unproven uh, intervention if in the physician's judgment it offers hope of saving life, re-establishing health or alleviating suffering, and that in all cases the uh, new information should be recorded and where appropriate made publicly available. So th this may be clear to many people in the in the audience um, what, what the difference between a, a treatment and a trial is. So in a trial you always have a pre predetermined protocol, in a treatment you don't have a, an absolute protocol. In a trial, you have strict inclusion criteria, not so in treatments. Uh, in trials, you can sometimes have placebos, in treatments not. Um, in trials, there's often, at least in oncology, there's often uh, interventions with, which don't benefit the, uh, the patient, for example, taking biopsies, um, but the, you can't do this in a, in a treatment. Uh, uh, almost always, the, the trials, uh, clinical, Drug trials nowadays they have a sponsor with commercial interests, um, but not so not so in, in treatments. Uh, and uh, um, I would claim that even during my professional career, uh, the, the the clinical trials climate has changed quite a lot. They are incredibly tightly regulated and uh, also very very uh, expensive. Um, so basically, only drug companies can uh, can do uh, trials. Uh, in treatments, there's very, very little uh, regulation except for advanced therapies, so cell therapies, gene therapy, where you, where you at least have this EU regulation. Um, and, uh, uh, but on a philosophical level, of course, trials can uh, help uh, society and uh, facilitate the development of products which might eventually help millions of patients. Um, while a, a treatment, in a treatment, the only goal is to help that particular patient, and there's usually limited uh, benefit to society. <coughs> so the uh, the algorithm of uh, translational cancer uh, therapy, uh, if you take an industrial-based view, is that you have a new, new drug, for, and then you test it in the lab, in animals, you produce it, you get the regulatory approvals, you do a clinical trial, uh, you take some biopsies, you learn something, um, while in the patient-based uh, translational approach, uh, there's some similarities in that, in that first you study in the lab, um, there's maybe less uh, of a formal process for the uh, preclinical work that needs to be done, it depends on the approach. The, your approvals are mostly from the, uh, the patient itself, and then in the case of uh, gene modified viruses. You also have to have gene technology board approval, um, and then you then you treat. And uh, again, you can uh, come up to co conclusions, and and often often the conclusions will be that okay, maybe it worked to some degree, but it didn't maybe work as well as you, you hoped. So you go you go back and you try to improve it. It's like if you look at the history of medicine, you know I would I would claim that about 95 percent of uh, the development of medicine has been do uh, done with this approach. So if you're, if you're a surgeon, for example, um, in, in surgery there's still a, a, um, quite a lot of a sort of learning, learning, by, uh, learning by doing and you know, a lot of this philosophy that the older surgeon teaches the younger surgeon how to, how to operate and, and so on. <coughs> but of course we were hoping that in some cases the conclusions would allow us to then uh, convert the process into a, a drug development process uh, because it was clear that with this individual approach you can't treat all, all cancer patients uh, in the world. Um, and you know, we were hoping that it would, uh, it would work and then maybe you know, we could find then a sponsor to convert it into a, a clinical trial. 
So overall, we treated 290 patients uh, using 10 different uh, viruses uh, that had been constructed in our university lab. Uh, all patients, they had metastatic solid tumors progressing after routine treatments. Um, and female, the, the Finnish FDA um, was, um, was, was regulating production and safety, so they don't actually regulate the actual treatment but they do regulate the production, and, and then they require uh, annual reporting of the, of the safety, including a, uh, um, um, a sort of a uh, safety versus efficacy uh, analysis. So in reality, they, they also get the uh, efficacy data from the patients. To summarize the <coughs> adver adverse event profile, uh, all patients had mild to moderate flu-like symptoms, fever, fatigue, tumor pain, and there were no treatment-related deaths, um, suggesting that it was a safe approach compared to chemotherapy or surgery, for example. And in this sort of uh, patient series, you can't, uh, you can't prove the, uh, the efficacy of a, of a treatment. It's not, it's not meant to do that. Um, but keeping in mind that all patients had progressing disease prior to treatment, and in about half of the, uh, the patients, the uh, the disease stopped progressing. It suggested that some patients, some patients did did benefit from the treatment. I mean, keeping in mind that all all patients had uh, already received all the routine treatments before um, uh, getting this therapy. And now, with a longer follow-up, it's been it's been fun to see that um, that even though all of the treatments were stopped in 2012, uh, the very latest, there are still some some patients who are alive now, um, uh, 10 years after uh, treatment. So here's one patient example, a six-year-old boy with a neuroblastoma. Uh, he had uh, gone through five lines of chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant. Uh, he had metastasis in his bone marrow, so this, this, uh, um, this brown stuff is all tumor uh, in his bone marrow. Um, and then he had metastasis. Uh, he had also the primary was growing here near the near the left kidney. So we injected uh, half of the virus intravenously and half into this uh, kidney tumor here. Um, and then uh, in a bone marrow bone marrow aspirate at one month, uh, the bone marrow was uh, clear uh, of tumor. And uh, at three months, we did a bone marrow biopsy, which is more accurate than the aspirate that's shown here. So, so all of this uh, Swiss cheese looking stuff, uh, there's actually healthy bone marrow, that's what it's supposed to look like. But there was a little bit of tumor, so we hadn't completely uh, cured him. And the, um, the virus circulated in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the body of the patient for at least three weeks. Um, and there was an increase in anti-tumor uh, T cells also. So although this patient uh, and probably several others benefited from therapy, Actually, our conclusion from uh, after the first year uh, of, of doing these treatments was that usually oncolytic replication alone is not uh, enough to cure these sort of advanced tumors. So, um, so then we started paying, to, paying attention to um, an observation we had made in, in patients where um, sometimes it wasn't the first treatment that was the most effective one, but in fact, uh, if we ended up giving the patient the second treatment, sometimes the second treatment was much more effective than the first one. So the lighting conditions are here are not really optimal here, but uh, the, the, in this pancreatic cancer patient, the, the only measurable tumor was here in the, uh, in the spleen, and um, that didn't react to the first treatment, but after a second round of a treatment, it, it got um, quite a lot, uh, got 76% uh, smaller. Uh, so when this started happening regularly, uh, it really pointed at uh, the immune response as a possible mediator of these, uh, these benefits, because that's the way the immune system works, is, is that if you boost it, it uh, tends to get uh, more effective. And therefore, we made the next generation of viruses in the, in the lab, uh, this time coding for a molecule called GMCSF. So these type of viruses, they kill tumor cells in, in three ways. Well, you have the oncolytic effect, uh, so the lysis of the tumor cell, uh, then the, the transgene, GMCSF, it recruits natural cure, killer cells to the tumor, um, and then GMCSF can uh, recruit and activate dendritic cells, which are sort of the master regulators of, 
of cancer immunity, uh, which can then lead to a, a cytotoxic T cell uh, attack on the tumor. So in essence, with this, uh, this approach, you're, you're developing a personalized cancer vaccine for, for each patient there uh, at, the, at their tumor. So here's one patient who was uh, treated with, with this approach. It's an ovarian cancer patient um, who had very low disease burden, actually. Um, uh, but the, uh, and the only measurable disease uh, then disappeared uh, as a result of treatment. So, so that was a, a complete response. And then when, um, when we collected some of this data for publication and reporting to FEMA, uh, this uh, survival curve looked very unusual. Um, I mean, you know, the field of oncology uh, didn't understand uh, immunology very well at the time, so we were, were wondering what's going on here, but of course now um, with the advent of checkpoint inhibitors we see a lot of these sort of uh, curves where, where the curve sort of plateaus off. So they, um, I guess the clinical interpretation is that not every, not every patient benefits, but those patients who do benefit, the benefit can be a lasting one. <coughs> so here's one a patient example uh, treated with a GMC Ceph coding virus. This was a a 49-year-old woman with fibrosarcoma um, of the hand, which had been uh, amputated, but nevertheless the tumor came back in the in the lung. So th this thing, uh, I don't know if you can appreciate it here in this uh, lighting condition, but there's a football-sized tumor which uh, which which should not not be there. Um, and then we started the virus injections. Um, so before before treatment, she had. Uh, uh, already reduced performance score. She was only able to walk 500 meters. She had difficulty breathing, pain, uh, tiredness. Um, at one, uh, at three months, she was already able to walk uh, four kilometers. Um, she didn't have to rest uh, in bed during the daytime. And you can see the tumor getting smaller, still getting smaller. At and then at nine months, these are these now in complete uh, metabolic uh, response. And she was uh, she was symptom symptom free. Uh, at nine months, and, uh, and she she told her story in some um, some 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 magazine, so I can share it here. That she had made a funeral list. Uh, you know, she wanted to decide who would at attend her funeral, um, but because of the treatment, she was now able to uh, use the list. But this time, to invite people to her uh, fifty-year-old uh, uh, birthday party. Um, and then how about systemic level efficacy? Um, keeping in mind that the preclinical data suggested that you should, you may be able to get uh, systemic efficacy dis despite local treatment. So here's a breast cancer patient that was injected here in the uh, liver lesion. And at three months, the liver lesion was smaller, but she also had another lesion here behind the sternum. And that's actually an area which you can't inject because there's the bone there uh, and you can't inject through bone. Uh, but interestingly, this uh, distant lesion had completely disappeared. <coughs> um, of course, uh, in these treatments, the main, main idea is to try to, to help the patient. But it was um, also quite interesting for us, uh, having built these uh, drugs, um, to, uh, to see what happens in humans. Um, so it was, uh, we were able to establish uh, that in some cases, even large tumors can disappear, like in this ovarian cancer patient. Uh, 50% of the of the tumor was was gone in in about 17 days. Um, then we had some um, lab data suggesting that we're able to kill what are um, cell types called cancer stem cells, um, which may sort of in part underlie the good long-term uh, results. And then something we had we and the whole field had basically missed in the in the lab because in the lab you work with cell lines or sometimes you use these nude mice which lack uh, T cells and you, you grow tumor xenografts in them. Uh, so these mice don't have an immune system. So we had completely missed the uh, tremendous uh, immunological effects that uh, oncolysis had. Um, but, but those were easy to de detect in patients. Uh, in melanoma patients there was a lot of redness developing around tumors. Uh, lymphocytes were going up, on, uh, up in the blood. And we really started to understand and maybe to pick the patients that are benefiting the most. We had to uh, study quite a lot about uh, immunology. <coughs> so 
Um, at this time, uh, the treatments had been uh, ongoing for about uh, five years. Um, and uh, overall, I would say that the treatments were safe. Uh, there was no mortality. And, uh, uh, and I would claim that, the, uh, that many patients benefited. And uh, we had had a lot of interactions with uh, regulators of all uh, different levels. And everything had gone quite well, I would say. Uh, but then there was a, a new uh, department head was selected uh, at FEMA. Uh, uh, and he wanted to establish himself in the, in the regulatory uh, community. And uh, um, he asked the police then to investigate uh, if this treatment program was, it, was in fact not a trial uh, done without the trial permit. And this resulted in the sponsor of the program, um, which was a biotech company I had found, uh, founded, to then stop these experimental treatments uh, immediately. And then uh, well, when, the, when the head of uh, of a department at FIMI, I asked the police to investigate. The, the police, um, you know, they don't think they're smarter than the, than the Finnish FDA, so they, they investigate and then it goes to the prosecutor and then it goes to the judge. Uh, so this whole process took two and a half years and 230,000 euros of legal costs and there was a five-day trial. And maybe we can do a little, uh, a little bit of audience participation here. So. So who thinks that the judge's decision was that it was a clinical trial done without a permit? One, one brave one. So who thinks it was an uh, experimental uh, therapy? Most of you, okay. Well, you can, you can, you can read the, the book if you want the, the full, <laughs> full story, but um, the, you know, the majority was correct that it was uh, the judge's decision was exactly as predicted that it was an experimental uh, treatment. Um, and so in the meanwhile, the, uh, when the experimental treatments were winding down, um, the, uh, the biotech company I had founded uh, was able to collect enough money to do a phase one clinical trial with one of the viruses that we had been using in the experimental treatment program. And to summarize the, uh, the results from that trial, it was sort of very uninteresting in the sense that the results were exactly as in the, uh, as in the experimental um, treatment program. So to summarize, and uh, in, in fact, I don't see it here on this screen, so I'm gonna have to come up here. Um, cancer immunotherapy has entered routine clinical use. There's many classes of uh, immunotherapy drugs out there. Uh, there's one uh, oncolytic virus, which is approved in the US and EU. There's also uh, two other ones, which are, one is approved in uh, China, and then there's an interesting drug which is, uh, was approved during the uh, Soviet uh, Union, and it's never been, uh, so none of those trials have been published in, in English, but it's nevertheless uh, approved in Latvia and I think three other Eastern European countries. So our uh, brave uh, uh, effort, uh, this advanced therapy access program. It was a way to give patients access to experimental oncolytic treatments, which they wouldn't have uh, had access uh, to without the program. And uh, we learned a lot from the treatments. We learned about antiviral and antitumoral immunity. Um, we were able to generate several new treatment agents based on what we saw in humans. And the fastest uh, idea to patient time was 10 months. Um, and which is quite fast because in a, in a, in a biotech environment it, it can take about eight or ten years of, to go from idea to the first patient treated. So the, the science was advancing um, really quickly and, um, and, the, and the patients um, you know, also benefited from the advancing of science because they were able to get uh, newer versions of the, of the drugs. The efficacy to safety ratio was, um, seemed excellent. Um, and our production also developed quite a lot during that time. But in fact, when we looked back, you know, there were, there were no differences in the safety regardless of how, how and where we produced the uh, drug, even though the, the cost of production actually changed quite a lot uh, over time. And we also found some ways to uh, personalize the treatment for each um, the patient, so, and we identify, identified some prognostic factors. And the legacy of this program is 
um, is to, to buy tech companies which I have uh, founded and which continue uh, uh, doing, doing clinical trials. But uh, of course, the number of patients in those trials is a lot smaller than in the, in the treatment program. Um, and let's see if we can get this to work. I have a little video here. The, for some reason, the, the screen is not working here. But let's see what happens if I click this one. Yeah. So there's no sound. Um, and uh, this boy is the six year old boy I was talking about earlier. Um, the Finnish TV made a program, program out of him out of him and um you know he had um had to leave preschool because of all the pain in his um uh in his long bones because of the metastases and in fact one month after the first uh, treatment he was able to go back to school because the pains were so much less and here here he is uh, playing uh, with his uh, sister so with that i'll take the last slide and thank you for your attention <laughs>